this is a spoiler. You can't listen you know. to this and not have spoilers. Nathan, it's your, it's your, uh, it's summarized yeah, yeah, that's the, that's the feeling I get. Um, <laughs> <laughs> getting a summary uh, feeling. Yeah, I, uh, so yeah, let's start at the beginning, huh? I mean, uh, it's kind of like he wakes up. He's, you know, waking up to the world. I think he's in his 12th year at this point, so he's an adolescent monster. Uh, he talks about how he's come down from the other side of the Cain and Abel lineage. He's a son of Cain and a monster. His mother is, uh, this Claude described as hag in the book. There's dragons that live down below their home in the cave. And, you know, he's just wandering around at first. It, it, the, the first complaint that he gives, I think, is very similar to the one he gives at the end uh, about the ram. And he, he wants to scare this ram off of his section of the mountain. And he says that he, he's standing in this puddle of water and he gives this scream that's just blood curdling and it freezes the water in his feet. It lets out so much energy. And the ram just blinks and stares at him and stays right there. And that begins his struggle with reality um, and other people. And he makes a man a nuisance, you know, so he goes out and he finds them. And uh, there's one time where he gets caught in a bear trap and that's the first time he sees men. I feel like there's a there's a section there that I'm missing. Uh, you guys jump in here. Yeah, it was the first time I think. And uh, and he's caught in a tree, and he knows that right. whenever he wakes up after having passed out from the pain, that something is wrong because he can't hear anything. And there's a smell as well, and that's whenever he hears the first men coming up, uh, approaching him. And you know, there's a there's a. It's interesting the way he describes them because they're. I mean, they're obviously men, we can say that now, but through his eyes and the language of the narration, they're just new kinds of figures. You know, they're bearded and they move their hands when they speak, you know, sounds. And he slowly figures out that, you know, they're intelligent and that that's what makes them dangerous. And there's an interesting little uh, character. He's like a wizard that comes up and he's looking at Grendel and they're trying to figure out what he is. They think he's a, a monster-shaped fungus growing out of the side of the tree and... After he screams back at these guys, the, the little wizard walks up to him and looks in his eyes. And, and through that, he sees that Grendel's hungry or scared. He's hungry. He would like a pig. Um, but that's, uh, but that, that's just like a little interesting moment where there's a little cross-consciousness boundary border thing. And, and Grendel's like, yeah, he's right. I would. Uh, and then something else happens, and uh, he ends up screaming and frightening everyone, and then everything's gone off. So it looks like he's mortally wounded, caught in a tree, going to die, and he starts yelling for his mother. And soon enough, Mama. she comes down out of the hills, just roaring and terrifying everyone. And that's the first encounter with man. And I think that he's flirting with this boundary of civilization for most of the book. Um, uh, so after that, uh, what, what happens after that? He... Uh, gets brought down, and now he's uh, interested in Hrothgar, the king um, that found him, and he's watching man as they expand and build a civilization in this, I guess, uh, you know, early Europe. And you, you see, what I thought was really interesting is you see how there would be a fireplace, and that fireplace would turn into a hearth, and then that hearth would turn into a mead hall, and you could see the lumber from around them coming into these places, and across the mountains, other people were doing this, and there was this bubbling up of civilizations, and within those bubbles, there was, I think, Hrothgar, who decided to go to each one and begin a kingdom, and this is the first, this is the beginning of man's kingdoms, and he begins taking fealties and growing in power and strength and singing songs, and uh, and this is where uh, Grendel comes in, you know, he goes down to see everyone, and because he's outcast, he plays the monster and uh, threatens them, uh, bashes, you know, eats men. I mean, you know, he he's absolutely a monster, but also in this world, like, so are the men. You know, they're also on their hunting trips and, and you know, covered in blood and, you know, fighting each other to the death. So uh, time goes on, and he speaks to the dragon. Uh, it gives him a lot of pause about reality, and... 
ultimately he meets Beowulf, who's not named as Beowulf. You know, this is this is Beowulf's story from Grendel's perspective, and uh, he's slain. He's he's killed, uh, and his mother can't help him this time. And it's unfair because it was just an accident, <laughs> so he says. Though it was also an accident whenever he was caught in the tree, and the the line that he has that he's you know the master of his own world and he's the most powerful thing that walks around is really challenged and he's confronted with you know the reality principle and it looks like that it's just a great injustice that he's been uh, that he's been slain this way whenever he had so much potential and that's what he's mourning at the very end of the book um, shouting you know it was just an accident uh, it could have been you poor Grendel's had an accident. Or Grendel's had an accident. So may you all. Yeah, yeah that was good. So yeah, I like summer. that. I like that. Um, and yeah, it also should be noticed, noticed, so if you, so the edition that I have actually has some line drawings of Grendel. Yeah, there's, there's even about, the Kindle has it, yeah. Yeah, I, I really I really enjoyed them. I mean, that, yeah. uh, they're, they're just interesting. But if you go to the end of the book, and so you read that last line, um, which was, yes, uh, poor Grendel's had an accident, so may you all. And then I was flipping through the last couple of pictures here and just taking in the novel, and I got to the end about the author. And the last line of the author is, he died in a motorcycle accident in 1982. <laughs> so, I mean, wow. it's, it, yeah, really. So may you all, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, what, and this was written in 71? I'm not sure yeah, about I think that. it was published in 71, yeah. Yeah. Um... Yeah, well, I didn't mean, put them together actually, but that's pretty uh, worth ruminating on. What? That he died in a, a motorcycle accident? Yeah. It's funny how the uh, universe ties up loose ends. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it gets down to something deep about the book, too, which is that, that existence and reality and your consciousness all feel so primal and real and you know necessary, and there's not another world, and you know he thinks about killing himself sometimes, and then you know, steps back from it. He he feels, you know, uh, that he could just jump off of a mountain and that would end it. But he's in charge of that, so it's ratifying the consciousness there too. You know, he, even though he may imagine that he could die, that's still him imagining it. So he walks around with this, you know, puffed up version of his own existence, and you know, he can easily kill men. Um, you know, he's not threatened by anything really, except for the world and his own gruesomeness. I mean, he has no community. In this way, he's very much like Frankenstein. You know, he has no one that he can sympathize with except for his mother, and, you know, his mother is the manifestation of his feelings. You know, if anyone's got a little bit more reason to go out and shout at the world, it's Grendel. But he comes back and he's saying, Mother, it's all void, it's meaningless, it's, you know, stupid, you know, people are petty, and, you know, she can't do anything but pull him close, you know. Do, do. All right. Let, let me. I want. Can I read a section here that I think it goes to what you just said, which is um. Where is this? This is page. I think it's page twenty-eight on the Kindle. I don't know where it is anywhere else. Um. It it says it starts here. The world resists me, and I resist the world. I said that's all there is. The mountains are what I define them as. Ah, monstrous stupidity of childhood, unreasonable hope. I waken with a start and see it over again. In my cave, out walking or sitting by the mirror, the memory rising as if it had been pursuing me. The fire in my mother's eyes brightens, and she reaches out as if some current is tearing us apart. The world is all pointless accident, I say, shouting now, my fists clenched. I exist, nothing else. Her face works, her face works. She gets up on all fours, brushing dry bits of bone from her path. And with a look of terror rising as if it, as if by unnatural power, she hurls herself across the void and buries me in her bristly fur and fat. I sicken with fear. My mother's fur is bristly, I say to myself. Her flesh is loose, loose, buried under my mother. I cannot see. She smells of wild pig and fish. My mother smells of wild pig and fish, I say. What I see, I'm sorry, what I see I inspire with use, usefulness, I, tr I think, trying to suck in breath. <clears throat> excuse me, and all that I do not see is useless, useless, a void. I observe myself observing what I observe. I can't breathe, and I claw to get free. She struggles. I smell my mama's blood, and alarmed, I hear from the walls and floor of the cave the booming, booming of her heart. 
I think that it, it's fascinating the the relationship. Well, aside from the fact that he's such a self aware monster, and I'm really getting into these self aware monsters. Um, but <clears throat> this relationship with his mother. Um, which is on one level like non-existent and on another level so deeply profound and and suffocating. It's interesting to see. Yeah, it's um, almost like she's holding the fire down. You know, she won't leave the cave really. He's the one that wanders out and she's keeping the, you know, just like the dragons deep deeper down. I mean, they're just holding on to the old world and their memory. That's their job is to keep remembering. So I, I got a feeling... Um, from the beginning, but really when um, when the shaper came in and started telling lies um, and the whole Cain and Abel thing, that this was that that the way that he was looking at this was the mind body split, and that the that Grendel is basically the you know in in quotes the problem of carnality in a world that has turned to reason. Or thinks it's turned to reason. It turns out all to be lies because when you de- when you try and deny your carnality, what do you do but create wars? But I don't know. I was hoping that you guys would want to explore that a little bit because I don't have you know. I mean, I have lines and stuff like that about it, but I wondered if anybody else picked up on that. Um, that you know, it, that if duality. our animal, well, just that you know that the the vulgarity or the the presumed vulgarity of our animal nature and if you know it when when we turn away from it the kind of war that goes on within ourselves well i know um i had a lot of things mixed up with with the shaper coming in as well and i think when he comes in it's uh i mean grendel sees all this death and destruction the civilization that's burgeoning as was mentioned and then this guy comes and starts giving this mythic alternate history of what actually happens, how Hrothgar is actually really good, and it's an alternate reality. And it moves Grendel so much that he wants to believe it, right? He, I think he runs up to them, begs for forgiveness for being a monster, but is not let into the fold, is is uh, driven away. And that's when he goes see, to see the dragon, right? And I think that, I mean, the message of the Shaper in how important it is... Um, for civilizations and peoples to have defining myths is intertwined with uh, how important it is for people themselves to have their own uh, mythic stories about themselves. And that's really shown through that one hero who, uh, or wannabe hero, what's his name? Woolgirth or something like that? Oh, yeah. Wait. Unfirth? Un- Unfirth. Unfirth? Unfirth, yeah. Unfirth. So, I mean, what Grendel struggles with, or what the book struggles with as well, is with how we live our lives and radical freedom. And I think you even mentioned, Laura, that it's, uh, like, he takes a lot of Sartre's ideas. Yeah, he does. Mm-hmm. That's what um, he said. Yeah. I could just say this one line on page 104. Uh... I knew, for one, that the brother killer had put on the Shaper's idea of the hero like a merry mask had seen it torn away, and now was reduced to what he was, a thinking animal, stripped naked of former illusions, stubbornly living on, ashamed and meaningless, because killing himself would be, like his life, unheroic. So to tie all this stuff like loosely together, um, it's about this radical freedom that we have as people, and yet we can't handle it. We have to give ourselves some sort of backstory. And what Grendel's going around doing is sort of forcing people to uh, confront the fact that that's not true, that Unferth isn't a hero, he's play-acting like one. Or that all men are playing play-acting like one. Exactly. And civilizations aren't great, they're just following this mythic story that was created. Well, like that idea of it's all an accident. Yeah. There's no order. Mm-hmm. And, and man has tried to impose order. I mean, even the line that you led, uh, read, Laura, about um, he mentions focusing in on things and getting rid of alternatives. It's about how there's an infinite amount of data and senses and things that we could look at in life. And yet we narrowly focus on several key points to create this fluid story when really it's a, you know, it's a jumbled mess. <laughs> Hence the accident. 
But I mean, I think what's interesting is that, again, I, I've only read some of what, what Gardner said about why he wrote this, but that um, this idea of this monster, and I guess we could tie Frankenstein into it. I mean, the, this other, you know, again, I guess back to that duality, and I guess what Mary was touching on, um, is this other is the is the central theme here that that um goes that goes against or abuts against the um what we define as what is human or man or woman you know what i'm saying i mean it's interesting to me that we we're looking at these fair and i get it, maybe this idea of the self or a monster but i mean why what are we learning here from these so-called others can I just read a quick note I made? Um, sure. W when you mentioned Sartre, I looked at my old notes that I had on Sartre, and I right. have this one line, and it says, uh, Shame is by nature recognition. I recognize that I am as the other sees me. And that's for being a nothingness. Right. I am as the other sees me. The reason is that we're constructed as well by, of course, others' perception of us, not just our own. Theoretically. Theoretically, yeah. Well, we wouldn't have any perception of self if we didn't have other, right? That would be impossible if you live in yeah, a vacuum. Yeah, it's not possible, right? Yeah, you can't, you can't. Ideas can't, no. don't come out of a vacuum, right? There's a process that he goes through in order to sort of get that self consciousness. It seemed like to me um, when he begins. Okay, <laughs> I read an interview with Gardner where he said that what he wanted to do with Grendel was. Quote, in Grendel, I wanted to go through the main ideas of Western civilization, which seemed to me to be about 12, and go through them in the voice of the monster with the story already taken care of, with the various philosophical attitudes, though Sartre in particular, and see what I could do, see what I could break out. That's what I meant to do. And the interviewer says, do you go through all 12 major ideas in that book? And Gardner says, it's got 12 chapters. They're all hooked to astrological signs, for instance, and that gives you nice, easy clues. These ideas, which have been around from Homer's time to John Updike's time, and all good men have taken one side and all bad men have taken another side on these basic issues, because they are ideas that go through all history, maybe the book resonates. For one thing, I keep echoing people, borrowing from people. I steal lots of things all the time, and if my stuff works at all, it's because there's one fusing vision. Um, so that's kind of the sense I got. Um, going through it, and I didn't finish making my list of what the 12 ideas were. I don't even know if he was serious about that, but I did get a sense that he's taking this character all the way through the Western philosophical or intellectual tradition. Um, I just, I mean, a few of the philosophical ideas I made a list of going through here was you've got the idea of the state of nature, you've got Plato's allegory of the cave, you've definitely got um, the cogito in there from Descartes. It, it seemed like you've got Hegelian's, uh, a Hegelian process of coming through self-consciousness. You've got the social contract. There's stuff from Sartre and Heidegger in there, and there's, uh, I think, even the phrase will to power was used at one point. Yeah, it was. Um, it was. So it seemed like Grendel's character, and this is what made the book, I thought, difficult to summarize and really kind of get a boundary on, is because he packs so much philosophy into it that uh, it, it's hard to tell when one little thing begins and one ends. I didn't think as I was reading it to use the chapters as boundaries, so I don't know how well that worked. But I, I saw the stuff that Laura and Cesare were saying, and I just wanted to add that little bit to say that it seemed to me that it was sort of a process there where that uh, seeing himself through the eyes of the other and coming into awareness um, is a part of, uh, you know... It, that's subsequent to coming out of the cave, right? And it's um, with what Nathan was talking about in his summary of seeing the men. That uh, Doesn't that initiate the part where he starts uh, thinking there's this presence around him and he starts sort of uh, observing himself? Yeah. There was a part right after what you were quoting, Laura, where he says, uh, um, when he says... What I see, I inspire with usefulness, I think, trying to suck in breath, and all that I do not see is useless void. Right. He then says, I observe myself observing what I observe. It startles me. And he says, then I am not that which observes. I am lack, a lack. No thread, no frailest hair between myself and the universal clutter. I listen to the underground river. I've never seen it. So 
it seems like there he's having this revelation, right, that he can take that distance from the Cartesian theater, which, you know, goes you can, meta, 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 you can go all the way. And so then he realized, you know, that's a difference, I guess, between animals, maybe in like a higher form of consciousness, where like, you know, you're operating at first with just what's right in front of your face. And then when you encounter the other, you have this distance that you see through their reflection, you know, this ability to observe yourself and from there it sticks with you right yeah but this could all have been um put out or set out by a human being why 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 is this all coming out from a monster well you know and i think i wonder about that too like this notion that you know grendel is a monster you know and he's also split between man as the story that he believes that he's on the wrong side of evolution i suppose or he's a remnant of an old world and you know he certainly is more capable he's not like the other men but he's also not like a whole cloth monster either i mean he's just a lone entity it's almost like a feral man you know being brought up outside i think it's also important to remember that um after he speaks with the dragon he gets this what is it blessing or curse of invulnerability right so for the second half of the book his actions and his thought process um one of the things he doesn't have to worry about is death right so what is talking to the dragon is that getting religion or something i mean what does that actually what does that actually signify mm. what makes you invulnerable <laughs> not That's giving a shit if you die like I, I don't know Hmm? No, it, it's some kind of charm, I know that. Right, so, I mean, is it just magic, or is this actually supposed to, you know, what's this be, supposed to be? Be like that, he believes it, yeah. I, I mean, does belief make you invulnerable? Was he really invulnerable, or can we rely on, you know, what he says about himself? Well, I can pretty much sure that you've got a 12-pound, hairy frickin' monster, you know, coming into your meat hall. He's gonna be a little invulnerable. You know what I'm saying? I would love to see a 12 pound. Yeah. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like a little dude. You know what I'm like? <laughs> you saw I, I, meant, I, meant, I, meant, <laughs> I meant 12 foot high and it meant 12 pounds. <laughs> That'd be great. It would be oh, even better if he was 12 feet tall and 12 pounds. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> His really long hair came in. Okay. We can, we can, we can now write, you know, mini Grendel. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but, it's the bunny um, from the Holy Grail. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, but I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, exactly. So this big dude, this big and scary guy, scary something, enters, you know, your house. You know, he's invulnerable. I mean, again, where, what what is this? I mean, it, what what? It, I mean, as Mary says, what is the point of him? Or what happened when he talked to the dragon? And what is this charm or this? you know, gift that he was given to make him invulnerable. I mean... Do you think that it was introspection? I mean, I really am trying... I really did kind of get the idea that this was, you know, that this was some sort of mind-body split. Yeah. And that if he's if he's gone in to talk to the dragon, then, you know, I don't know what it, what it actually signifies. I think it was a confidence signifies. that came from introspection. Huh. Can you say more on the mind-body split, Mary? I'm just trying to piece that together. I, I mean, I... I don't know. Maybe it's just the way that I think. Whenever I read anything, I try and just separate out with the, that what this means if it were simply a singular internalized voice. So Grendel is the monster, the monster that lives within us. I see him as carnality because he's so physical. His physicality is is his main feature. <laughs> or maybe that's cannibalism. I don't know. But um and he and the the split the Cain and Abel split. So what is it that happens when an animal becomes self aware and um and you take reason and try and make you, you know he's he's looking I, I find him I see him looking at uh the thing that really pisses him off is that you know there, he, here are these people and what they've done was separate themselves by reason but then it all turns out that they lie it it turns you say that you're reasonable but you're just like me you kill like i do you say that you're heroic you were running scared you didn't do any of these things that you said that you did and why would you deny me now why would you deny my physicality my carnality the things that i do why do you say that i'm the monster when you've just gone out and killed everybody that kind of stuff 
That's interesting. I guess, though, like, even though the book is a book of being in his head, the way he makes himself known to the world is by sheer violence. No one takes his thoughts seriously, even though he has the ability to communicate, right? Yeah. The, the one time Although he I think speaks, it's hard rejected. to hear him. I think it's, I, I think that he's, it's difficult to hear him. But did he say he learned to speak? Like, he taught himself to speak? I think that he language. learns the language of the men. Right. But I don't think that he speaks it well. I think that like he he'll whisper things to himself and he'll talk to himself, but it like it when Grendel finally understands what he's saying or when um uh, Unferth understands what he's saying, it takes them a while. Like at first they think, "Wait a minute, you can't speak." Yeah, and you know, he's also uh you know, like at the first, you know, he like, you know, yells at the ram, you know, and it, <laughs> it's so funny. Like that's such an, like, uh, and, you know, and these men, like, the, you're right, like they mishear him. Like he's not, he's, uh, you know, quite a part. He's another animal. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, that, that bit at the beginning because it kind of sets you up for his lonely world whenever he's walking and a doe sees him and freezes and then yeah. remembers its legs and then takes off. And he's like, oh, you know, blind prejudice. Damn it. You know, I've never eaten a deer and never will. Like, I respect them. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. he, he does see beauty. It's just also, like, the ugly, like, I don't know. I don't find sympathy for the men in this, though. Yeah, so, like, I mean, he I just really goes sympathize with just... Grendel. I, I got a line about the deer, if I could just read that quickly. Page yeah. 8. But deer, like rabbits and bears, and even men can make, concerning my race, no delicate distinctions. That is their happiness. They see all life without observing it. They're buried in, like, crabs in mud. Nietzsche! There's also just that right uh, after he says, this goes back to the mind thing, talking, talking, spinning a web of words, pale walls of dreams between myself and all I see. Hmm. There is, um, I've, I've got one from page 43. <clears throat> this is when the new shaper comes in and the, and the former Harper leaves. It says, The former Harper crept out into the darkness, unnoticed by the rest. He slipped away through fields and forests, his precious old instrument under his arm, to seek out refuge in the hall of some lesser marauder. I, too, crept away, my mind to swim in ringing phrases, magnificent, golden, and all of them incredibly lies. And of course, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm reading people's history of the United States right now. So of course, you know, to the victor go the spoils and, you know, history is written by the victors. So there's that part too, which I think, which I always think is interesting and kind of disgusting and funny. Well, but um, what he loves about the shaper is that, you know, this is from 49. He says he takes what he finds and by changing men's minds, he makes the best of it. Right, but he's like a simpering sycophant too, right? <laughs> like he's. <laughs> well, I think that he respects his his art as well, because you know he yeah. says, you know, uh, if the ideas of art were beautiful, that was art's fault, not the shapers. Right. He doesn't attribute it to the shaper. It doesn't yeah. belong to him that the properties of what he's working with have these effects. He's just learned to kind of spin them out for his own ends. But I think yeah. what's going on here too is that Grindel is he's observing this just property of existence that these stories can have this effect and he's ob observing the effect that they have on men and he's fascinated by the fact that this guy can come and tell these stories this poetry and this art and it can you know rouse these illusions in men and send them out to shape the world um, to the reality of those stories and so but he's frustrated he tries to cast that spell on himself and it doesn't work he says he reshapes the words he reshapes the world, I whispered belligerent, so his name implies. He stares strange-eyed at the mindless world and turns it and turns dry sticks to gold. A little poetic, I would readily admit. His manner of speaking was infecting me, making me pompous. Nevertheless, I whispered crossly, but I couldn't go on. Too conscious all at once of my own whispering, my own eternal posturing, always transforming the world with words, changing nothing. I still had the snake in my fist. I set it down. I fled. So he, he's unable to, he can't get the consensus that comes from men's community by just, you know, trying to imagine the world as such. He still confronts reality. And so there's a difference there between what the Shaper's doing and what he's trying to do, and he's recognizing that, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think the Shaper and the Dragon are uh, opposite forces as well. So what I think that Grendel loves 
this was put, this is about the shaper, this is on 49, he says the projected possible. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Grendel likes about the shaper, it, it alludes to another world. But then on 54 he, you know, he says this, he's, he's smiling about it, he thinks imagination. Some evil inside myself pushed out into the trees. I knew what I knew, the mindless, mechanical bruteness of things. And when the Harper's lore drew my mind away to hopeful dreams, the dark of what was and always was reached out and snatched my feet. So, you know, the illusion is quickly dissipated by the reality of, like, the cold, dark world around him. And I think this is what the dragon reminds him of, the the timelessness of the dragon. It's something more like science, and actually, you know, he has a scientific uh, mind, the dragon. He talks in a, in a fast-paced uh, kind of flurry of intelligence that loses Grindel. So I think that the dragon is this other kind of logical mind side. And He also gets really frustrated with, with yeah, people who won't, who won't understand him, which, I, you know, it, yeah, I also found interesting. I mean, what does he learn from the dragon that, that like, he, the dragon tells him about the, like, the nature of time and how nothing's really important if you just expand the bounds that, of, uh, expand the scale that you're looking at, right? Mm -hmm. And the dragon's dictum is to, like, hoard treasure and count it, sometimes put it into piles, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> And that way, I guess you could see him as a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the putting it into piles part, like separating things out and, and you know, getting to the to some sort of physical essence. I I, I personally thought that um, I think someone mentioned the book was slightly overstuffed, and I thought in some of the um, speeches it was a little too philosophical, a little too jarring. And I'm not sh like I reread that dragon speech many times, and I'm not sure how it spurred Grendel onto the path that he went on afterwards. I couldn't connect it. <laughs> All right, I have a question. Okay, I don't think anybody read this. This is on page 51, actually, about the I guess the shaper, and it says here the harp turned solemn. He told of an ancient feud between two brothers which split all the world between darkness and light, and I, Grendel, was the dark side, he said in effect, the terrible race God cursed. I'm back to this, I'm, I'm really, maybe it's my, you know, natural stupidity, but, <laughs> my, but, my I far prefer your unnatural stupidity, <laughs> Okay, but my question, my question, my, what bothers me is, why we why he and I read this what he said in that interview that I posted in the in the email um, that Gardner said that and it was really a question of strategy you know he said you you write these stories um, that have already been written and it's got to end the way it was originally ended which is in Beowulf obviously as we all know Grendel is the monster in Beowulf and was killed by Beowulf um, that, he, that Grendel has to die as he does at the end of this book spoiler he dies and he has to die um, but what Gardner was saying is that by writing this story, which is using a traditional story, I can get to the what to that ending in any way I want and say whatever I want, right? And so my question is why? I mean, he never really. I mean, let me just say as an aside, I can't stand John Gardner, okay? <laughs> now, I, I really can't. Because I just, you know, he, he when he talks, and I know that he's he claims he was a medievalist. He claims he was very involved in ancient um, literature and very fascinated, and he taught about it, blah, 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 blah. And I expect he did, but, um, and I don't know 100% about him, but he just drives me crazy. So it's like a chemistry thing. You know, when I read what he says, I'm like, there's something only really bothers me about what he's saying. But what my point is, is that um, when I think about, when he talked about the strategy of why he wrote this particular book and he used Grendel the monster to say what he wanted to say philosophically, why use an other? That's my thing. Why, wait, why when um, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein, okay, what what was she doing by, I mean, she was doing a lot. She was saying a lot by, uh, about Victor Frankenstein, about his family, about the time, by creating this monster. But, you know, the question I have is, okay, all of these fascinating philosophical things that Gardner brings up in this story, why is he doing it with an other, with a physically, you know, mo physical monster versus just a really cool guy who knows a lot of shit, <laughs> you know? 
Yeah, I'm not really sure why he took uh, this particular medieval story. Yeah, and he said, like he says here, and I, Grendel, was the dark side, he said in effect, the terrible race God cursed. I mean, I'm very sensitive about this uh, on some level. <laughs> and maybe it's maybe it's because of my hairy body and my na- natural b- monster. Well, I'm joking. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> anyway, no, but it's a it's a serious, fascinating topic for me that the physical is such uh, back to the other concept is so different from quote unquote humanity and, and we and he's using this creature who is physically so different to make the make these statements and, and investigate these ideas that are philosophically profound and that humanity essentially lives by. I'm just wondering why. Well, what does that do for 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 that study? What does that do for him, what he's trying to say? To do it through the voice of Grendel, to do it through the voice of this monster who ultimately gets killed by man. Man is slaying monsters. Man is slaying evil theoretically throughout life, throughout history. That's our goal. We have wars. We have these battles. We're trying to kill the other. We're trying to kill the evil. I'm just wondering about that. That really bothers me. <laughs> Well, I mean, when you, when you have, um, when, you know, I, I, I would just, I don't know that I want to actually second what you say about Gardner, because I don't know enough about him. I did find I don't I'm just that I was about halfway through the book that I found that the language was getting too precious, like too consciously precious for yeah, me. Exactly. I love beautiful language. Yeah, yeah. I really, I really do love beautiful language. And as I said earlier, I, I have a very easy time you know, suspending my disbelief, stuff like that. But I don't, but I, uh, there was something that made me uncomfortable when I was reading it. Like all of a sudden I was just like, okay, maybe I'm tired of this now. I don't quite get why I'm tired of it because there's beauty there, but I feel like it's, it's a very conscious beauty that it's not flowing. And, um, but be that as it may, I, I would say that, you know, I think that you use that the, the way that he used the other, the way that Mary Shelley used the other is to make us examine something that is other and find a sympathy there that we might not find if it were uh, a human. If I were to tell you the story of Charles Manson, of a, of a modern monster who is not other, I mean, his actions are other, but he's Physically, the same he's flesh. Physically, not and, other. Right. So, but if you separate it out and say, let's... Let's take a look at this other and you will, f- and, and perhaps you will find sympathy because I'm anthropomorphizing this monster. I'm actually making it, it may look different, but I'm actually, you know, I'm, I'm giving it human qualities. So when you find the human quality in it, then you can have sympathy. Perhaps you can even have empathy. I think that that's why they do it, but I'm not positive. Yeah. Well, I mean, but he's not, not just giving it anthropomorphizing it, but he's also, He's giving it sort of a quality that even rises above what these other men are like, or these other humans are like in the Mead Hall, Unferth and Hrothgar. Hrothgar. I mean, he's like, in a way, the Gardner is saying that Grendel is so self-aware and so thoughtful in that way, it kind of rises above them philosophically. That's what I thought was a little overstuffed about it, because, I mean, he takes... He packs so much into this character from the beginning of the book to the end that it's almost like it just blows out the bounds of character at all. Mm. So by huh, the time, I mean, by the time that you get to the end, I just like, uh, yeah, I felt a little exhausted and I felt a little bit uh, disoriented about, you know, wh- what even am I dealing with? What, you know, how do I, <laughs> it just felt a little I unwieldy. totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. That someone could find this much beauty and, and still be perfectly happy to go eat people if you <laughs> you know it, it seemed a little strange well it that, raced through just so much progress so much uh, flux yeah. you know in such a small amount of time that you you really had difficulty getting your bearings like you know which, between trying to figure out the shaper and the dragon and then you know grindles changing all the time and the men are doing things all the time and it's you know in in, in a sense like I, I like that you you get the sense that you know all of reality is this one sort of flux but it was extremely difficult as a reader to sort of take up that task of having to be on guard for interpretation every moment and then i also felt like 
you know, anything close to realism was definitely the wrong approach to looking at this novel. So, you can't... well, yeah, I mean, he said he hates realism. Yeah. <laughs> Although, I, you know, if he hadn't been constrained by the poem, then it might have been more interesting to have Grendel be a monster of, you know, of great age so that he actually watched, you know, he did stuff a lot of progress into, and it was all in Rothgar's lifetime. So really, the world right. actually didn't advance that much in Rothgar's lifetime. Right. In reality, yeah. So, right. um, but, so it might have been more interesting to do, to do it outside of it, but there was the constraint of Beowulf. Yeah. Because he, he could have gone another route, right? He could have taken a much more sort of microscopic approach to the little bracket of progress or, or whatever in any one of those philosophical ideas and just mm -hmm. said, this is what we're going to look at in this particular moment and really get, you know, really zoom in on it. But instead, he went for a really long stretch of uh, time and, and ideas and, you know, put, packed it into one. So you get sort of a survey feeling. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, and also I have a question about stuff that happens toward the end of the book, which I really don't know what the fuck was going on. And it might have just been me, but there's this whole period where, I mean, it just, there. it's kind of like he gets into a dialogue. Like, is, I said, is he writing a screenplay here? Like, <laughs> you know. Or, or Do you mean just, the poetry section? Is that what it was? Was it poetry? I, I, got, I got lost. I got lost. I said, well, maybe it was because I was reading it late at night, but. But is that what it was? Was it just a, 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 a sort of inspirational poetry on to the next chapter? You mean with uh, Throthulf, the cousin? Um, maybe after that, yeah. Maybe around that time. Um, I'm trying to find the... Uh, it's like toward the end of the book. Um, Are you, but I don't... Maybe you're thinking of the first, second, third, and fourth priest's conversation with Orc. Uh, the priests, yes. It may be around the time of the priests, yes. Because oh. that's broken up with third priest colon first priest colon. Right, in right. I mean, it kind, of, yeah, it kind of took on a new, <laughs> new format, and I was like, okay, all right, whoa, what, 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 where are we? Which is fine, okay, fine. But it kind of lost. I lost. I got lost. It's one thing to change format, and I'm cool with that. Um, but y you need to hold your reader, you know, to what you're doing. I loved when, when Grendel fooled the priest, fooled the blind, blind priest. Wait, where? <laughs> I laughed the whole time. <laughs> Was it the yeah. priest name Orc or something orc, like that? Yeah. Orc, right, yeah. Um, poor Orc. Poor Orc, my ass. <laughs> Those <laughs> priests have been terrorizing people, I know. making them I know, I know. stand up the statues and stuff like that, uh, trying to make what, what they were saying relevant. Um, I just, I thought it was really funny. And I also loved it when the young priest came in and, and that was something that made me start thinking about carnality <laughs> because the young priest was like, yeah, let's use our bodies. <laughs> what are we even doing? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Just on, on Orc, his line, the nature of evil may be epitomized, therefore, in two simple but horrible and holy propositions. Things fade and alternatives exclude. Yeah, I, I like that line. I did. Yeah, that was a good part. <laughs> yeah. I, I felt like the the <coughs> section with the dragon for me and then the section with the shaper, those were the two most interesting moments in the book. Um, and uh, I liked so many parts of this book. It's just that they never seemed to achieve a synthesis. Um, mm -hmm. the style felt like it was isolated of the content, you know, the, the ideas felt like they were isolated of each other often. And I, like, I really got into this section with the dragon. I thought it was really fun and interesting. It was I, fun. I reread it like Cesari was saying. Yeah. So, and, and the, the shaper as well. It's just that it didn't become, a, it never become a whole for me. But at some point I, I want to get back to that section on the dragon because I think I read it a little bit differently. Well, I want to talk, yeah, I, I mentioned I wanted to talk about it because, um, I guess, what do you think his prognosis was for Grendel? And do you think it was convincing enough to set Grendel off on the path that he went off? Let me see here. Hold on. Yeah. Well, so he's, you know, in the beginning, he's yelling at the ram, right? Because the ram is stupid and that gets on his nerves. And you see that sort of echoed in, in um, the dragon's same frustration with Grendel, right? Because he can't understand. And one of the things the dragon is telling him is that, you know, there's a relativity that holds, you know, 
in, in terms of size or in terms of anything you want to measure where whatever frame from which you're doing your measuring is going to determine the measuring itself. So, you know, what's stupid and intelligent to you is going to depend on the point where you are and, you know, your particular place and embodiment in the universe and, you know, your, uh, you know, that, that stands for size, that stands for, um, you know, complexity, it stands for, you know, all kinds of things. So I, I think that has to do with, I, I think ultimately what the dragon is, is he's a sort of, um, he's Grendel taking that logical uh, approach that reason rationality um, as far as it can go in within the context of his own mind and then when he comes out the other side of that episode with the dragon he's in that existentialist sort of place where he's going to choose um, because what what happens when he first um, meets the dragon is that he's just encountered the whole episode with the shaper and so that's sort of resonating with him and he's contemplating that and he's gone back to his cave with his mother. And I actually think that the dragon, in some ways, is just the inverse of his mother. Um, and I don't think the dragon... Like I said, I think it's it's t probably wrong to look at this novel in any kind of realistic lens. But I think that the dragon, you can say, in some ways, doesn't really exist in the novel. Because what he says is this. He's uh, being crushed against his mother's bosom or whatever, and he clamps his eyes shut, and he says, after a time, I slept. And then at the end of that chapter, he says, I sat up with a jerk. This thing was all around me now, like a thunder charge. And this is that presence that he's been sensing around himself. And he says, who is it? I said, no answer. Darkness. My mother was asleep. She was as dead looking as a red, gray, old sea elephant stretched out on the shore of a summer day. I got up silently and left the cave. I went to the cliff wall, then down to the moor. Still nothing. I made my mind a blank and fell, sank away like a stone through the earth and the sea toward the dragon. So I think he's doing this in his mind. He's not actually going down to see any dragon. This is a sort of dream or a sort of uh, reverie. And uh, yeah, well, Except there is a I dragon in the original poem. Sorry. Uh, it's, it's why I thought that it was introspection, meditation, something like that. Religion. It, or that he had, yeah, that he had was doing some form of of inner work. With that That's what the I dragon thought. was, yeah. And see, the dragon's got a lot of parallels with his mother too. I mean, she's the red gray old sea elephant sitting on a pile of bones and dirt, and he's the mm. red golden dragon who is his. His mother's too stupid for for words, right? She's she's gone that far away. But the dragon is just he's a, the eloquent serpent, and you know he's you know his mother is you know sitting on bones because, you know, and she doesn't want him to go out to the outside, but the dragon's going to give him knowledge and tell him, you know, you, you choose what you value. The best thing is to just pick, you know, something and he's picked gold. And <laughs> I think there's a lot of parallels there. Yeah. Yeah. Just pick something and count yeah, it. And so <laughs> right. <laughs> How do you square the, his gold counting with, uh, I have a line here. That from the dragon on page 67. The essence of life is to be found in the frustrations of established order. The universe refuses the deadening influence of complete conformity. And yet in its refusal, it passes towards novel order as a primary requisite for important ex experience. We have to explain the aim at forms of order, and the aim at novelty of order, and the measure of success, and the measure of failure. Apart from some understanding, however dim-witted, of these characteristics of historic process. His voice trailed off. I'm not sure how his gold counting and stacking have anything to do with uh, screwing up established order. <laughs> huh. I don't. It, so, do you think that the that the counting that the that the sorting out is science or pure reason or you know applying pure reason to nature? Like his his mother is is nature at its purest um, form. Well, yeah, kind of like animal nature. Well, I mean, giving and, birth is yeah. animal. Yeah, and but no reason, and the dragon is so much reason that you can that Grendel doesn't understand. Like Grendel can't find a way to understand nature through pr pure reason. Maybe I don't know. I wrote some questions about it. Like, who the hell is the dragon? <laughs> what is the dragon? Is the dragon Here's what actually? Gardner says about the dragon. He says, uh, the dragon looks like an oracle, but he doesn't lay down truth. He's just a nasty dragon. 
He tells the truth as it appears to a dragon, that nothing in the world is connected with anything. It's all meaningless and stupid, and since nothing is connected with anything, the highest value in life is to seek out gold and sit on it. Since nothing is emotionally or physically connected, you make piles of things. That's the materialistic point of view. Many people spend their lives, rightly or wrongly, doing nothing but filling their bank accounts. My view is that this is a dragonish way to behave, and it ain't the truth. The Shaper tells the truth, although he lies, but I don't think there are any oracles in Grendel. Interesting. So, so the dragon is a capitalist. Action. Okay. <laughs> right. The dragon's on Wall Street. Scrooge McDuck. <laughs> He's diving into his pool of gold coins. <laughs> well, you could take them both with an existentialist lens, right? I mean, that's one choice. That's one way to live. If you're, if man is the measure of all things, then you can take the materialistic route. You know, if you're choosing your own values, that's one way to go. But well, it's also, yeah, it's also funny how he tells, you know, Grendel, you know, scare them, don't scare them, it doesn't matter, do whatever you want, uh, you know, life's your choice. But the way the dragon chooses to spend it is to be very dragony, right? Like the, <laughs> dragon. like the way we think of dragons is as a fire breathing thing singing, sitting on a top of a pile of gold. <laughs> yeah. Well, his is know thyself. That's my dictum. Know how much you've got and beware of strangers. So I think that what you asked Cesario is like, how would it upset the established order? It would be in the hoarding. It would be in the getting and the keeping. And and by sitting on it, you would effectively dominate that space and keep it intact and not let it slip away. Don't touch my gold, right? That's the one thing you can do to piss him off, is to take something away from what he's accumulated. And for him, that's all of it, is just to get and to have and to hold on to eternally. And... You know, he, he you know, even says that, like, you know, someone's going to stupidly kill me, and it'll be a conservationist will wail, but it'll just be a stupid speck of, you know, uh, dust flipping in the void, basically. You know, and, and, and as far as, like, what, what are you going to do, you know, he, he said, you know, uh, Grendel's like, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to find out. And he's like, yeah, go ahead. Do something else, by all means. Alter the future. Make the world a better place in which to live. Help the poor. Feed the hungry. Be kind to idiots. What a challenge. You know, and, and he says, "Let me tell you what the Shaper said," and he's like, "Please don't." <laughs> I guess, I guess I, I forgot that, um, like the dragon is not hoarding gold in order to put a down payment on a house. I guess when he takes the gold out of circulation, it is really screwing up things up because you know, gold is useless apart from how humans see it between themselves. I guess that makes sense. Yeah, I um, the opening to chapter ten, I thought had some interesting idea, isn't it? It, it starts out, tedium is the worst. Um, let's see if I can actually find a page. Um, oh, okay. okay. Tedium is the worst pain. The dull victim staring vague-eyed at seasons that never were meant to be observed. The sun walks mindlessly overhead. The shadows lengthen and shorten as if by plan. The gods made this world for our joy, the young priest squeals. The people listen to him dutifully, heads bowed does not impress them one way or the other that he's crazy. <laughs> the scent of the dragon is a staleness on the earth. The shaper is sick. So he kind of pulled, he kind of pulls everything together there. Like it, you know, hits each aspect of what he's been looking Doing. at. But I'm interested that it opens with tedium is the worst pain. Yeah. The point being that make it exciting even if it has no value. If, if, if what it is, is if if what life is is experience, then yeah, tedium would be the worst pain. If you ha if you're not having, yeah. it, you know, if what your experiences are are tedious, right? What did Camus say about the man who lives with the woman for forty years just oh, because yeah. he's bored, or you know, he doesn't realize that he's just telling himself a story until one day? It's like, you know, the. It, the boredom, you know, it can become such a pain that any story is better than nothing. And it, it's indicative of that maybe that you see men who are so busy while Grendel just kind of, he can't really figure out a project for himself until he can finally fit himself into their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think there's something to that because it, it is, uh, I don't know, I, or I, I think there's something interesting to the need that people have for, you know, to feel that our lives are invested in some sort of narrative, to feel that we have significance in relation to something else. And, you know, when you're the only one who's 
in charge. This is Grendel's difficulty. Is that when you're the only one who's in charge of that story, then you don't have any constraints, you know, by which to measure your significance in that story. Hmm. Yeah, I guess what's the point or what's the meaning is a very common thing. But not just an overall arch, but it seems to be in everything, in every micro aspect of our lives. You know, the only reason we walk is so that our heart is healthier, so that, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Which is a shitty motivator. I mean, people, you know, seem to, you know, I look on Craigslist and there's all this exercise equipment, right? You know, <laughs> we buy it and we want it, but we just can't bring ourselves to sit in a place and ride a bike going nowhere for forever, you know? <laughs> Pod, that's where podcasts come in. <laughs> yeah, like one of the most depressing things that, you know, I've ever seen in, you know, grocery line magazines, which is a common thing, it's like, how many calories can you burn by having sex? It's like, oh. it's like <laughs> it turns out to be right. like really, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, is that, really? Is that Are you having sex with that you're only burning four? Yeah. Do you have to have your app on? Right. You have right. to turn on the app, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Uh, and this, I never you know, get bored unless I'm at work. I I know that that's a kind of a ridiculous thing to say, but unless I'm actually forced to be somewhere, um, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't get bored. I don't have, I don't have tedium. I don't have tedium unless I'm, I'm in a forced situation where, yep, there's other, there are things that I'd rather be doing. So. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I only get anxious that I'll be dead before I get to do all the things I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know, I envy all of you guys. <laughs> um, you're bored everywhere, or you're you know, you have you, there's tedium outside of your. Oh, uh, I feel like I'm often fighting that disenchantment of the world. You know, what's that Louis C.K. skit or, or that he was some part of his stand-up? He was talking about you know, you have those days where it's like four o'clock and you're like, man, just why isn't it bedtime yet? <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I know those days. Yeah. There are too many books to wonder why, though. The inherent joy in every task, you know, it has to be there, and if it's not, you can't just argue it back into it. It's like <sighs> things have to be worth the trouble or everything in life just becomes work. And that, that's what yeah. a good story can do, I think, and yeah. what that sort of And, and that's it. not what this story does, right? <laughs> it did. <laughs> I mean, I'm asking. I, you know, I, it's funny, I, I was, I fought myself a bunch of the time that I was reading it. I kept saying, it's... This is real. Like, there's so much beauty here. I'd get a little bit disgusted with it, but then I'd read another line, and I'd go, "Man, that's a really, really beautiful way of putting that." Right. So I don't know. I had, I, I was, I had, you know, ambiguous feelings throughout. He's obviously a really good writer. He has really good ideas. <laughs> you know, he has obviously had a very good mind. But yeah, there was. Yeah, the critique that someone already mentioned that um, they stuffed so much into Grendel as to make him an unbelievable character. And I think that uh, that's probably where my thoughts are as well. Yeah. You couldn't connect with him in any sense apart from this series of jumbled ideas he goes through. Mm, well, I, would... I, I find myself on the other side, like, that having, I really agree with Grendel. I mean, it, it, like, his... Wait, the monster? On, the monster, yes. Yeah. I, I His... His anger at the humanity he sees around him as hypocritical. That everyone is... I mean, the thing is that Grendel, yeah, is blood-covered, sure. But, I mean, so are the Thanes and the Geats. And they're murdering their brothers when they get too drunk. And, you know, killing and hunting animals into just turning, like, the immediate space around their halls into a quiet wasteland. I mean, he, mm -hmm. he doesn't see any way to oppose this. At one point he says something like it would be impossible to stop man. And I'm like, oh, and, and that, that rings with me too. I've thought about that. It's like, yeah, what could you do? Like, even if you did, as Grendel does, set himself the task of, you know, just destroying all of it, he, he, he couldn't. Um, and he's left opposed against it and formed against their, you know, acts. And, and he plays with them a bit, but he's still, he's still um, suffering because of them. But isn't that also something that is being said by Gardner in this story is this comment on, maybe he's not saying it, but uh, this comment on humanity or man that the monster is destroyed by man. Well, here's the thing about Beowulf at the end, though. He's insane. 
Well, in theory. <laughs> well, I mean, by by the by the uh, just just by the story. I mean, he he's as he's like the dragon at the end. He even has wings and fire coming out of his mouth. Right. You know, he's this timeless thing that he sees like eclipsing him, but he doesn't have he you know he can't be reasoned with either, and he is just the mechanical bruteness of the world coming after him. You know, and, and, and Grindel would have been able to do it if it wasn't just for like that, you know, like he slipped on the blood, he thought that he wasn't, he knew something was off, and that's where I think the crack started. He realized what he was, that he'd come up against something, he got a smell or something, and then it started to widen, and yeah, he kept was going smell. closer, and he didn't, yeah. and he just didn't realize, and, and he reached out an arm, and he, he had, had a whole life where he never had any problems. Uh, or not never had any problems, but he never had any problem taking on another guy until this one, and he could have seen it, but he just slipped, you know, and then they got him, uh, and then he loses his arm, you know, and it's it's too much, and it's terrible, and, you know, and he's running away again, and, and you know, he wishes he could, you know, kind of take it back, or he's seeing everything around him. So, wait, so you're saying that he was he could only have been slayed by a crazy person, a crazy man? I mean, there were a couple of other crazy men in that mead hall. I don't think that has that much to do with it. I think that's like Nathan saying, if I'm understanding you right, I think Grindel's trying to project onto the world his vision of things because that provides a sense of control. But what Beowulf sort of represents is that reality principle you mentioned earlier. So he sort of sees the end or the crack coming before it even actually comes. And maybe Beowulf just kind of represents that interceding of the reality principle where you know, when things are going fine, sure, tell yourself whatever story you want. And, you know, you can manipulate the world to the extent that you can. But there is something outside of you and your vision of things. And he eventually... That you can't control. Yeah. And even, you know, he's it's it's like the, the wings and the fire and all that at the end. It's like he's desperate to recast this event as something, you know, that he's, you know, got a handle on. But it's not working. He rips his arm off. It's like, you know... the. That right there just lets you know, like, no, this physicality, it's it's real, you know. Map it however you like, but, you know, your body, like Mary was saying, it's, you know, you got to protect that. <laughs> yeah. Destroy and Nathan, it. I would say that I, I actually agree with Grendel, too. I mean, it's, it's, it's not, you know, in his sentiments about what's going on around him and watching the hypocrisy in the world. I didn't have a problem with that part um, at all, but I... I I mean, I I still wonder kind of about the the problem that I had. I think that Daniel might have, you know, that it, that it might be what Daniel was talking about with just trying to stuff too much into it. I also felt like it was a little precious, and there was a, I, you know, I get real because it's so easy for me to suspend my disbelief. I get really upset when somebody ruins that for me, especially the author. <laughs> like if I'm in a movie and they break it, like they they kill it, it's just like all right, I'm done, I'm leaving. But I would have sat there through the whole thing, even if it was terrible with in my disbelief and, and been perfectly fine to not have any kind of judgment about it until the end. But there was something about it that broke it for me with the book. Oh, I see. And it might have been that, like, overstuffing. Mm. Yeah, I see what, yeah, I see what you mean. But yeah, I have to say that between the two, much prefer Grendel to Gardner. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'd rather just... have a beer with Grendel. Yeah, no, I would absolutely <laughs> hang out with Grendel. Way before I'd hang out with Gardner. Just make sure he's eaten first. Make sure he's <laughs> I found a... Um... Oh, okay, I was going to say, I'm sorry, Cesare. I think I cut you off before. But not at all. I just, um, I know uh, you mentioned, Laura, why pick a monster for this book, and I found a line which may shed some light. Okay. Um, this is the dragon speaking. He says, uh, you improve them, my boy. Can't you see that yourself? You stimulate them. You make them think and scheme. You drive them to poetry, science, religion, all that makes them what they are for as long as they last. You are, so to speak, the brute existence by which they learn to define themselves. The exile, captivity, death they shrink from, the blunt facts of their mortality, their abandonment, that's what you make them recognize, embrace. You are mankind, or man's condition, inseparable as the mountain climber and the mountain. If you withdraw, you'll instantly be replaced. Good. Mm. Yes. Interesting. Very good. Thanks, Cesare. I mean, it's funny that um, the sense I, I didn't, that, that didn't jump out at me because I was more concerned about Grendel in the sense that it, it, in what he was saying and his 
self-awareness throughout this and his experience. Whereas the dragon in that in that uh, quotation that you just read is focusing on f to telling Grendel why he's a, he's critical to man. And that's kind of like saying, I mean, I hate to go into this. So I'm having a fight with a friend of mine about duality, but <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's really it's true. It, we're fighting about he's it's actually and he's a priest too, and he's like you know he's Just, totally anti. So he wants it. In, he wants it in triplicate. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> No, no, but the point being is that, um, it, you know, in that quote, sorry, what he's kind of saying is that, um, you know, you can't, man ha must have evil mm -hmm. if you're going to look at Grendel as a representation or a metaphor for evil. An object. Of, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, it's, it's how adversity tends to make us a little stronger, right? It's how antibiotics work, right? Right, right. The in theory. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah, to some extent. Yeah. They don't know D with it. Um, yeah. One thing about this book was that uh, I mean it was we were pretty pretty much spoiled for choice as far as, f as favorite lines go. I like oh, yesterday yeah. what my uh, one of the more difficult things I tried to do was pick out what did I, what would I actually say was my you know the line that struck <laughs> me the most from this book and man there really were a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's it, that's agree. true. Surprising, <laughs> you know. Uh... But I guess we should try to do this, right? Yeah, I guess maybe we should we should move on. We, we've talked a little bit, and uh, there's you know some some split. I, no, there's no surprise. Like I read all this, I read Grendel in a day, um, and I really I, I really enjoyed it. And at the time, I was you know smitten with it. And there was a lot of lines. I don't think it's the best thing that I've ever read, and I, I don't think that it's you know genius. Um, but I do think that there's a lot of I think I've said this before, like brilliance to it. That's probably why it was on the you know top of the New York Times bestseller list for so long. Because it's not genius. It's taught in a lot of high schools. Yeah, yeah but it's real. But there, I feel like there is a lot here, though, and there's a lot that the character goes through just as a person. And by being outsided or being othered in this character, you really get to see, you know, the work of man. You know, you can really step back and watch how he's just like a bacteria moving around, and it doesn't have the same romance as if it was, you know, a, a son that was. Whatever. I mean, the story sets you up outside of it, and that way it gives you an, a better eye, like an alien scientist or something. But it's also, you know, very human. So this monster has within him all the things that a, a human would, and so they're both concerned with existence. Um, and it also seems like maybe they could have worked out, but it just did not. You know, they, he tried to make a friend, but it was too late because there was already an aggression. Like, how often is that not the story with, you know, human relationships? At least people, anyway that they don't forgive or they hold grudges and things are irremediably sent down towards destruction because of that. Mm. Well, maybe we should all do our uh, final thoughts and... Um, favorite lines! Yeah, and then we'll do favorite lines. Uh, does anyone have anything else that we just didn't get to um, that you thought was just, I don't know, maybe really quick, worth pointing out that we just absolutely left out? Mm. Well. I'm sure there was a lot. I mean, yeah. There were so many ideas in this book. Oh, sure. I mean, I know that there is objectively, but subjectively, if you have anything that, you know, you want to... A thought. Get, yeah, we, some, something. I mean, we, we talked about the Shaper and the Dragon, and, um, and yeah. We didn't really talk about, um, what is it, Hrothfald's wife, or... Yeah, what's her name? Withy? Wheelfowl? Wheelfowl? And it, and his teenage daughter, Freaky, Freaky, Free Throw. Oh, <laughs> we didn't talk about uh, Unferth. Like that guy's Unferth. story. Unferth. Unferth. Yeah, I and mean, he, was he the tries first. to go down and kill Grindel, you know, and he... <laughs> it's so sad. It's so comic sad. I mean, it's he gets bitten all over by snakes and can't <laughs> go through with it. And because the, the entrance to the, the underwater uh, cave or whatever is guarded by these snakes. and Fire snakes. Fire snakes. And he crawls up and he's just like uh, Monty Python, you know, like, come on, sir, you know, no <laughs> arms, no legs, like, I'll still take you on. Yeah. And he's just crawling on the floor, like, oh, you're, you're going to, one of us is going to die today. And Grendel, though, I mean, this move had so much character to it. He, he takes him back and never harms him. You know, and it, it might be some kind of gross cruelty rather than pity. I think that may be more in line. Um, I think it's he both. knows that he's got it. Yeah. Like, I mean, he releases the snake. I mean, he's just a wanton murderer, you know, even though he does murder for food. But we can look at that in a contemporary lens as something awful, but that's just because we're so separated from our own, you know, killings. He um, killed plenty for not food. 
That's true. That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But, also, I, I hear but you know, the thing is, like, I, I'm just trying to make it not a line of Grendel's the monster and humans are the good guys. Oh, yeah, humans are yeah. definitely not the good guys in this book. Yeah. But, you know, Grendel is a monster. Well, his immorality was central to his whole approach to everything, right? That that's how I took it anyway. Is I mean, there were no good guys or bad guys. It was just like the brute mechanical world. Yeah, that was one thing that I that I thought was that I would mention before we end is that uh, about Rothgar. Um, there's a line on page one twenty one. He's a giant. He had in his youth the strength of seven men. Not now. He has nothing left but the power of his mind, and no pleasure there. A case of knives. Mm. So I thought that that was interesting that you could really, you know, basically bringing around uh, something that kind of has to do with <laughs> with that I, the idea of uh, of tedium is that if you make, you know, it, what you make, what you focus on becomes your life and, you know, will certainly haunt you in your old age. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, let's let's do our favorite lines then. Like, maybe uh, you can just pop up and, and we'll just keep going round and around until, um, you know, we've gotten it. So start with Cesare. Sure, yeah. Sure. Well, right. wait a minute, that's a C, C, right? So then we go to Daniel. Daniel Laura, and Mary, and then uh, I need I'll to be find mine, so skip the moment. Okay. All right, um, I like this line, um, just because I think it sounds kind of as ugly as the message it's trying to say. It's on page 113. In ratty furs, the peasants hoe their fields, fat with stupidity, if not with flesh. Their food smells foul, the doorways, dungeon dark, where cow-eyed girls give tit to the next generation's mindless hoe. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but beautifully written. <laughs> yeah, it's one way of describing breastfeeding, eh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Daniel? All right, Daniel? You got one? Yeah, I'm, well... Well, I mean, can it be a paragraph or was... it's a line? Yeah, hit it. I mean, I just want to get all this good stuff out there. All right, all right, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry, Daniel. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll come back to the one I'm looking for, but one that I definitely enjoyed um, was... There was more than one, I think, but... When the dragon is talking about logic and he's saying that uh, of men, they have dim apprehensions, apprehensions such a, that such propositions as God does not exist are somewhat dubious, at least in comparison with statements like all carnivorous cows eat meat. That's where the shaper saves them, provides an illusion of reality, puts together all their facts with a gluey wine of connectedness. You know, it's. I just think like that's just a great little condensed critique of logic, right? It's logically yeah. sound, but of course, completely absurd. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was beautiful too. Cool, very cool. Laura. Oh, uh, wait a minute. L M. Oh, I'm for, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'm losing track of my alphabet. Okay. All right. So this is a dragon talking. I think page. What is that? Sixty-eight. Um, put it this way. He said. His voice had grown feeble as if he were losing hope. In the case of vegetables, we find expressive bodily organizations which lack any one center of experience with a higher complexity either of expressions received or of inborn data. That's my favorite line. And I'll tell you why. <laughs> because it expresses the um, total absurdity of this book. <laughs> That's why. So let's go have a drink with Grendel. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I chose one that actually I thought I I chose because of the mind body uh, distinction stuff that I was thinking about. Um, it's on page ninety one. Balance is everything. Riding out time like a helmless sheep boat, keel to hellward, mast upreared to prick out heaven's eye. Hee hee sigh. My enemies define themselves as the dragon said on me. Cool. So yeah, your body's hellward and your mind is in the clouds. <laughs> inspecting God, right? You're, you're up there inspecting God. If that's uh, where God is. Uh, historically, at least in paintings. <laughs> <laughs> Nathan. Okay, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take liberties here. I'm gonna do a bunch. Um, check this out. 
Uh, here is, uh, there's a couple of things we talked about, all the ideas. Um, here's just a couple. The will to power resides among the stalactites of the heart. Oh, yeah, I love that one. And then at the end, uh, there was a moment where Grendel is being bashed against the wall by um, Beowulf, who says that your mind makes everything. And then, I forget who says this, you guys can help me. But he says, ouch, you think I made that fucking wall? You're a lunatic. <laughs> and it's like, I, I refute it thus, you know, by kicking the stone, I think is what that's coming from. Oh, yeah. Um, Samuel Johnson. Yeah, very good. Yeah. There's also this right here. This is, I think, Foucault. Um, Public force is the life and soul of every state. Not merely army and police, but prisons, judges, tax collectors, every conceivable trick of a coercive repression. The state is an organization of violence a monopoly in what it is pleased to call legitimate violence. Uh, the ultimate evil is that time is perpetually perishing, and being actual involves elimination. <laughs> um, oh, uh, this is funny. The guards watch anyway, obedient to orders the king has forgotten to cancel. Damn. Um, <laughs> and then this That's is the uh, werewolf here. Believe it or not, though you murder the world, turn planes to stone, transmogrify life into I and it, strong searching roots will crack your cave and rain will cleanse it. The world will burn green, sperm build again, my promise. Time is the mind, the hand that makes. Fingers on harp strings, hero swords, the axe, the eyes of queens. By that, I kill you. <laughs> Is and I think that I may limit that there. <laughs> there did you, uh, I was wondering uh, what, if anyone else had thoughts about this line on page 93. There is no limit to desire but desire's needs. And then parenthetically, <laughs> Grendel's law. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Right. All right. Yeah, that would, I think that was probably the best part of this novel, right? These, you know, one-liners or two or three-liners. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. He definitely so that's, had that down. What is that, Aristotle, the whole um, desiring causing object? Hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's true. Interesting. I also like this one right here. It's just beautiful, I think. I saw my mother moving slowly toward the guy who was on the ground eaten by the snakes. And silently she moved past me. Blue murder in her eyes. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. Here's one on 157. Tedium is the worst pain. The mind lays out the world in blocks, and the hushed blood waits for revenge. All order I've come to understand is theoretical, unreal. A harmless, sensible, smiling mask men slide between the two great dark realities, the self and the world. Two snake bits. Oh, yeah. Oh, this, oh that, that was good. <laughs> well, I'd say we uh, damn near done it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. Right, Ellie? We did it. <laughs> <laughs> right. She's well, really along. quick, let's move on to uh, recommendations. Uh, what do you guys uh, have on the, uh, the shelves or uh, on the nightstand or whatever? I'm trying to remember. I just started uh, The World Beyond Your Head the other day. That's the one you were reading, right? Yes. I'm anxious to know how you find it. Yeah, I just read the intro, and I'm excited to get into it. Oh, yeah. Let, you'll have to let me know. I really liked that one. It dragged a little towards the end, but, uh, yeah, good. I'm reading two histories of reading myself. One is uh, A History of Reading by Alberto Manuel, and the other one is... Uh, the Proust and the Squid, and I forget who wrote it. <laughs> is that a uh, is that about neuroscience and reading? Yes, I've read that one. Yeah. Oh, how'd you like it? Uh, I recall it fondly, if a bit oversimplified. <laughs> okay. I just I I've gotten a little tired recently of just neurological explanations yeah. for phenomena, but um, it's interesting. Here, here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Looking right. up here at a Cloud Atlas, I've been meaning to get to it. I've heard that it's good, um, and I've started a little bit into Nausea by uh, mm -hmm. Sartre. Huh. I, I tried. 
I tried Cloud Atlas like ten times and was so I don't know maybe it's just something wrong with me. I was so bored by it. Everybody yeah. told me how great it was, and I was like, "What's wrong with me?" <laughs> I don't like well, it. that's usually whenever I know something's up. <laughs> whenever everybody's telling me something, I'm like, "Oh, okay. Well, I'll just hold off." People I really respect. Oh, really that's the difference. Yeah. yeah, and it's just like, mm, I'm just not getting it. So, yeah. Mm, well, I'll be interested to know what you think of it because we tend to like the same books. So maybe it was just you know something wrong with them. Who knows? I haven't started. I can't claim that it's going to be anything. But uh, you know, I always look forward to something. I want something to be good. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that is one thing about getting older, though. I have absolutely no problem putting something down. It's like, you know, when I was younger, I would make it to the bitter end of every single book that I picked up, but no longer. I will abandon it happily. No, there's far, far too much, and time is too short. Yeah, that's the deal, you know. Do you all want to uh, hang up the sound? Oh, yeah, right. the, we start talking about our business? Yeah, yeah sure. Bye. Bye. We I'll love try. you. <laughs> 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 Who do we love? <laughs> Who Are you talking to Grendel? <laughs> <laughs> Who do we love?